Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to a live chat with Nurse Linda. Today's topic is less often thought about body parts. Linda Schultz is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for close to two decades. Now I'm going to turn it over to Nurse Linda. Hi, Linda. Hello. Thank you, Kaylee. Um, and, and thank you everyone for joining. Um, you might, you've heard the voice of Kaylee, not know her, but uh, she is a person who does all the wizard, wizardry behind the webinar. So that's a wonderful thing to have, especially since I know nothing about it. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, so today, thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, who would ever think that at this point in time, we'd still be talking about COVID? And I thought, oh, man, I have to talk about that one more time. But, you know, now we've had Christmas. A lot of people have gotten together for Christmas and the Omicron uh, variant is here. And so uh, we uh, will suspect that the COVID rates will continue to rise. They've been rising pretty rapidly. But now since people have gathered they will really shoot up over the um, next um, month to six weeks. So we have to be really extra cautious, taking all of our precautions, staying away from people, isolating if you feel um, that you are particularly vulnerable, which you know we all are really, um, wearing our mask. Um, if you're able, if you have breathing problems or you're under the age of two, you don't have to wear a mask. But then, of course, you must be extra careful with your um, social uh, distancing and and hand washing and and maybe even uh, isolating in your home, because if you can't wear a mask, that's your basic level of protection for getting that, keeping that virus from uh, coming into your body. So um, just be cautious, super super cautious. Um, this Omicron apparently is a less um, virulent type of the uh, of the virus. However, if you get it, <laughs> you know, it's going to be the worst virus. I mean, you know, as I always say uh, to people, you know, when it's your problem, it's the worst problem. It doesn't matter how it compares to other people. You know, when you have it, then, you know, it's a real issue. So just be super, super cautious, keeping your wheels clean and, you know, because you have to, um, you have to, push your wheels. And so, you know, there's just all these little details of things to think about. Uh, so just really try to be safe out there. Um, the weather is turning really cold and wet. That is a big danger if you have um, mobility problems and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, just be careful going outside and keep warm uh, to avoid any uh, hypothermia. Uh, there's a question that just popped up, which is uh, pertinent to what we're talking about. Um, and that is how about a quad with a trach and oxygen dependent? Um, so you want to be able to be sure that your airway is clear. Um, you uh, might want to, you know, stay in or stay around, stay away from people. I have seen people um, drape uh, something over there, if they have a trach that's open to air, you know, they'll, they'll cover it in some way, but you have to make sure you're getting your air, that you're not closing off your airway. If you have a closed system, then um, you don't have to worry about the uh, virus coming in through your trach because the tube is, is connected there. Um, but it could still enter through your nose and mouth and you, you know, it could still enter your body. So, <clears throat> pardon me, um, wearing a, a mask is probably not really that advised, um, but you do have an open uh, system from your nose and your mouth. Um, the, um, the inflation cuff should keep the virus out, but there's so many different ways that that virus can filter in and travel throughout your body. And, you know, so we just have to be very, very safe. But thank you for that question because I know a lot of people would be wondering about that. So just stay safe, stay indoors, um, you know, stay away from other people. You'll have people probably coming into your house to do uh, care and that is, you know, you wanna make sure that they have been safe in the outside world as well. So um, today we're gonna to talk about some of those parts of the body that um, are often overlooked. And uh, one of those things is the trunk. And a lot of people think, um, 
Oh, there's a follow-up question. Even if you cannot breathe through your nose and mouth, um, which um, is safer, paper or foam? Um, <clears throat> so, hmm, that's something I'm going to have to ponder for a few minutes. Um, I think as long as there's, I don't know, I don't know the statistics on that, and that's that would be the pertinent. So I don't know the science behind that. I know that um, when we're talking about um, um, paper, if you have the kind of paper that is kind of not processed, like not woven kind of paper, like um, some of the masks are pressed paper, where they take paper fibers. Oh, we've got a bunch of uh, information that's popped up here for your reading pleasure. But um, the um, some paper is press paper, so it has even less openings, like the hospital mask um, versus a cloth mask or a paper mask that's uh, woven. Um, you know, some paper like paper that you write on. I have some before me right here has a lot of, this is woven paper, um, this kind of paper. It actually has little holes in it because it's woven and then it's processed. So um, it has some, it has more perforations in it than like the press paper. Now, ironically, you go to a fast food joint and you get those real cheap napkins. Those are press paper because they're cheaper to make. And so they are not abs absorbent because they don't let anything through the paper. So looking at those kind of things or the foam, um, which is, uh, is more dense. So I would think it would be the foam after it's dried. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave you to those and I'll have to research that a bit more, but there are some, uh, Donna, our assistant for today, has has um, has put up some information about that information. So um, we'll have to do more investigation onto that um, about that. So um, let's let's talk about those body parts that are often overlooked. And one of the body parts that's often overlooked is. Um, um, the trunk. And be, because you don't have a lot of movement, you know, in your arms or legs, you can certainly tell what's working. You have fingers, you have toes, you have joints in all those parts of your body, but in your trunk, you really don't. And so strengthening your trunk, it can be really a hard assessment. And it's hard to tell if you, you know, if you're doing therapy, if your trunk is improving, well, you might see better balance, you might have some uh, functional end results. But how do you know if that's really improving? So one way is you can always test on yourself the, the levels of the spinal cord on your body. So, and that, that's using what we call the two finger method. Now you have to use the width of your two fingers, which are in proportion to your body. But if you start at the natural nipple line, and I say we're the natural nipple line, because sometimes with age and with uh, muscular um, buildup, or with uh, muscle muscles shrinking, um, sometimes the the line of where the nipple should be has changed. It's elevated. It's it's gone down. So where your the natural nipple lines where your where your nipple should normally be placed on the human body, and then if you take two fingers from there and go down, you can you can measure your thoracic level. So the natural nipple line is T four. You go down two finger widths. You, you're at T five and go down two more, you're at T6. When you go down and you get to the belly button, you'll be at T10. Now, the reason why I say is it's important to use the person's, you don't have to use their fingers, but you can guesstimate the width of their fingers. So I am uh, have big bones, I have big fingers. Um, men have larger width of their fingers, larger finger, um, yeah, larger finger width than say a smaller, uh, more petite kind of woman. So, and when you get into pediatrics, if you're looking at the child, their fingers are much smaller than an adult's fingers. So you have to think about the, the bone structure of the person to use this. But when you do that, you can tell. So if you think maybe you're having some um, 
increase in function in T6, you can measure on yourself where T6 is. And then that is really helpful in knowing about how your trunk is functioning. So that's very, very, a very good kind of thing to do. So thinking about those parts of the body is always very helpful. And then also um, at the end of the year, I like to think about things that are going on in the research um, arena. Now, sometimes people are thinking about uh, research and there's some people who are, you know, I'm happy where I am. I've, I've got my life, I've adapted, everything's just going fine. I'm really not interested in more research because, you know, people talk about it. And this is right around the corner and then it's not around the corner. I get my hopes built up. So I really don't want to know about it. And you know what? That's fine. Everybody has their way of, of you know, living their life and it's just fine. So I don't want you to think that I'm pushing, pushing, pushing research um, on everyone. I just want you to be aware of what's going on. Because if there's something that strikes a chord with you, you might want to think about, hmm, maybe there are some things I could do to get myself ready for that. Or maybe there's some research out there that really sounds appealing to me that might really make a difference in my life and I want to get involved in that. So, you know, these are just kind of information. It's just information to have. Um, so some people really want to you know, they want to get involved in a certain kind of research and they think, okay, well, I, I want this, this particular thing. Well, you know, it just doesn't happen like that. Um, when there are new techniques that are uh, developed and new strategies, you have to have some uh, therapy. You know, it's not a magic wand. There's usually some pre-training that has to be done. That's why I say, you know, think about those parts of your body and strengthen those parts of your body. Um, that you can. A lot of people, the first thing they do is they give up their stretching uh, exercises because, you know, it's timely. Maybe you have to have somebody help you and it's hard to get somebody and it's heavy and, you know, a thousand excuses. Guess what? You're no different than everybody on the planet because, you know, it's going to be January. Everybody's going to make their New Year's resolu resolution to go work out. They're, the gyms are going to be overcrowded. And as they say, wait until February, because by February, the gyms will be empty again. Because, you know, working out is hard. It's a commitment. It's exhausting. It's challenging. And, you know, people just don't like to do it. We would rather sit around and, you know, kind of loaf and, <laughs> and watch, binge those TV shows, which they're advertising, you know, get this thing or get that thing so you can watch all these TV shows in one day, you know, oh my gosh, who wants to do that, really? Um, but anyway, keeping your body moving is, is very important. If you uh, have any kind of neurological injury, any kind of paralysis, keeping those parts of your body's functional, keeping them uh, moving, uh, exercising, that provides feedback to the muscles. It helps so many things. It helps um, your muscles continue to um, uh, contract and relax. So basically, um, using the hand as example, and my hand's going to look gigantic because it's so close to the camera. I should put it back here. Now I look very petite. Um, but anyway, you want to you want to be sure and exercise and move your hands. I'm pressing my fingers back just a little bit. You see, they don't go back too very far. Too far. They go back better singly, but as a unit, it's kind of hard. But go through and, and exercise every joint of your body because in, in your body state of relaxation, look at what my hands want to do. So if I don't stretch them out, the bodies that pull in tend to be stronger. So if I don't stretch these hands out, they're going to end up like this, get contracted, get tighter and pull up tighter and tighter uh, next to the body. It makes it more difficult. It helps uh, moving your body helps with um, um, blood flow, stimulating the circulation. It helps uh, if you're moving parts of your body uh, can help increase your uh, respiratory. You want to be sure, especially in these uh, winter months, to be doing some respiratory exercises, another part of the body that's often forgot about. So taking those deep breaths. Um, some people will use an incentive spirometer. Now, when COVID came, incentive spirometers, which you can be, buy them off the internet for like under $10 until COVID came. And now nobody can buy them. 
And it, it's not necessarily um, a supply chain issue, which probably is added on to the problem, but everybody started buying incentive spirometers because they wanted to exercise their lungs to keep their lungs healthy, to keep the virus um, away. And you know that was good thinking. So they became really difficult to find. You might have an incentive spirometer hanging around from your hospitalization time. It might still be in the original bag. That's always unfortunate. Um, but, but try to get an incentive spirometer. If you can't get an incentive spirometer, um, a very wise person told me about somebody who developed something, you know, it's one of these, and I wish I knew who developed this or got this idea because it was a good idea, um, was to get um, uh, one of those really wide straws, one of those big diameter straws like you get in like a milkshake or a fancy coffee or, a, you know, one of a um, slushy or something like that, a really wide straw and just hold it up to your mouth and inhale, exhale. If you're using the ventilator, you can use the, um, the side button on to give yourself a cleansing breath. But it, that really activates pulling down the abdomen as well as um, expanding the lungs. Helps keep the lungs clear. If you can provide a cough, that's also a good thing. If you can breathe through these, um, breathe in through one of these larger straws, and then you can cut the straw down so if you don't have as much drag on it, you know, just don't make it so small that you can't hold on to it and you swallow it. Um, but use that large diameter straw and then work your way down to a smaller and smaller straw until you finally get to like a swizzle stick. And then that really is breathing in and breathing out. So that's really very helpful as well. Um, so um, one of the questions that were was written in today was about some of the research that's going on. And I see that, that uh, Kenneth again has written in about unfortunately 43 years and there's not many research programs. And Kenneth, yes, you are right. Why would you be interested in research? You've heard about all this stuff coming and where is it? But right now there are some things that are happening and they're happening rather swiftly in terms of, um, in terms of neurological repair and improvement and function. There's kind of two sorts of two kinds of research. There's one kind where people are looking at actually repair of nerves and to improve function for spinal cord injury. And then there's people that are looking at, at devices that are developed that will improve uh, things. So it's kind of a twofold sort of thing. But anyway, if you're interested in research or if you're not, it's okay. But just you know, it's always good to have information because sometimes you can read about something and you think, oh, well, you know, like I can do the straw thing and that will help me. And, and these, are, these are things that will help improve your body functioning. Um, so some of the things somebody had written in about um, epidural stimulation, neuroprosthesis and exoskeletons. And at the end of the month, I had done some uh, two-part um, blog about research, one being non-invasive kinds of things and one being invasive. And non-invasive means things that are done to the outside of your body. So, you know, it's not really um, too risky. Um, invasive means implants going into your body. So that has a bigger risk to it. So you might want to start out with something that's not very risky if you're new to this. And one of the biggest things that happened this year, and it's just, to me, I think, I think this just needs, I've talked about it many times, but this just needs more publicity. And this is uh, something that they did at the University of Washington in Seattle. And so, um, you know, functional electrical stimulation has been, is really come into um, the forefront as a way of helping people increase function. And they're you know, talking about implants and doing research with implanted implants um, with, with what appears to be a great deal of success. And so what we were doing with uh, the functional electrical stimulation is you would put electrodes on different parts of the body and it would cause the hand to open and close or the arm to move. 
what's most popular and what most people hear about is the electrodes on the legs where people are pedaling uh, bicycles. And that gets a whole lot of movement into those nerves and muscles in the extremities. What they did at the University of, of Washington was they said, well, wait a minute, um, we're putting all these electrodes on arms, we're getting hand function. What if we put it right on the back, the base of people's necks, who have people who have difficulty with our arm function? And they tried this. Now there's a whole program for preparation of you know building up the muscles to be able to do something once you have the device on and then putting the device on and then they imagine that there would be a lot of therapy to learn to control use with the device well they put the device on a, a variety of different people who had problems with arm and hand function and it was I, I will say I will say immediate, but it wasn't you know like boom it was all better, um, but it was almost immediately people got this function even after just a couple of uses sometimes even sooner, they got this function and they were able to control it rather quickly, and so they're still doing their experiments and they're um, keep improving on this, but what they found out was that people could do this and. And it was so um, quick, the response was so much quicker that they and greater than what they had expected. And not only that, but people who had the device placed on them and then they would turn it off, you know, after the therapy session was over, there was a certain amount of hangover time where people could still do these functions even without having the device on. And so there's this has opened a whole new door of things. Now, the great thing about this is they have published their protocols and you can call them for the protocols. This is not a um, financial endeavor, at least at this point, um, but this is, this is something that you can just go online to the University of Washington, look up tetraplegia hand, hands and boom, it just opens right up to you. And so these, this is like this really cool thing, and it's just, it's just happened this year. And so it doesn't matter where you are. Um, you, can, you don't have to go to the University of Washington in Seattle um, to get this treatment. You can go to your physician. You can get the protocol off the internet. Um, your physician can order you uh, some therapy treatments to go to your local therapist. They can talk to the therapy people there. They can follow the protocol. They can try this. This is not like a, a secret plan. This is like really huge. So in thinking about if this can be done for hands and arms, can it be done lower down the body? And can it be done other things? It's just open the gates to so much. But for that small number of people that do have a problem and difficulty with their hands and arms, this has been a huge, a huge step. So yes, if you think about it, functional electrical stimulation has been around for a number of years. It really exploded in the uh, late 1990s and the 2000s. And now you go into a rehabilitation facility and it's really kind of standard of care that people get tried with this. Um, there are some hurdles with this financial being in that it's very difficult to get some of these um, devices like the bikes. Some people have real challenges in getting these. So there are ways to kind of work around that. It's not easy, um, but you can apply for your insurance. Um, it's, they're very expensive devices. Um, you can have one in your home, learn how to use it, um, apply to your insurance. They will automatically reject it because it's not in your policy, probably. Um, then you have to go through the appeals process. I had one man here in St. Louis um, that did this for six years, but he never gave up. And six years later, he got his bike. Now that seems ridiculous. You know, <laughs> here's something that's been proven effective, and you know, you still can't get it. But Technology is moving forward. Bike prices are becoming cheaper. I think it's helpful if you take, um, most people have two weeks of mobility training in their health insurance policy, two weeks per year. It doesn't have to be Monday through Friday for two weeks. It can be like a day, a week for two weeks. You could go to, you could ask to become involved in this because biking is mobility. 
You could ask to try out this uh, therapy and if it proves effective, then you have for you as an individual, then you have a little bit of more oomph to take to your insurance company. So utilize all the strategies um, that you can if you wanna get involved in this. If you don't wanna get involved in it, you know, that's your prerogative. But um, this uh, a reader had uh, written in about epidural stim. So that is one form of epidural stimulation that has taken off. The bike's been there, um, other um, putting patches, other electrodes, other places on the body has helped with other different things. Um, the, I think what they are really asking about it, the epidural stimulation is the implants, which is under study right now, and that's still going on. Now, what we all have to remember, unfortunately, is that a lot of this got slowed with the COVID. You know, what can you do? You can't go to a, a facility, and many, many programs had limited hours. You know, COVID's just messed up everything, hasn't it? So anyway, the studies are still going on with the epidural stimulations. They have released some preliminary information that has shown uh, cardiac improvement, uh, bowel and bladder function. You know, even if you're just range of motioning your legs, that's shaking up your bladder, reducing urinary tract infection. It's shaking up your abdomen, which is helping your bowels move. So any kind of movement helps bladder and bowel, which is always very important. Uh, neuroprosthesis is another thing that has uh, come out as uh, being very, um, um, has moved forward. Uh, something that has come forward is the neural sleeve, which is um, a garment that you Velcro, it opens up, you Velcro it on your arm, and um, it has electrodes in it. And so it, it puts the electrodes on all the different places on your arms to stimulate hand movement. This has been really popular in, uh, with a group of people who have stroke, um, but it's also, uh, potential for people with a spinal cord injury and other neurological diseases. So these neuroprosthesis where they're, um, they're either worn on the body like the neural sleeve or they're implanted into the body. Um, it's something a neuroprosthesis is like a prosthetic. So it's like, you know, we think of prosthesis um, with amputees who you know, will wear an arm or have a, a manufactured leg, that sort of thing. But um, a neuroprosthesis is one that works the nervous system. So it's not an uh, artificial limb as we think with um, amputation, but it's, it's something that's stimulating the um, nervous system to work. So those are all, those things are all uh, rapidly developed. This is just a period of rapid development. There are also, um, so you can get the neural, you know, if you're hesitant about surgery or, you know, you're not quite sure about going the route of an implanted neuroprosthesis, which they do have for um, hand function, they have um, for leg, bowel and bladder control, sexual function, and they, they have all kinds of uh, things that can be implanted. Or now, you know, you have this sleeve that you could put on, maybe you might want to try that first. And if you find success with that, then you might later on want to move to an implanted device. You know, there's so many options now. Um, the exoskeleton was another thing that was brought up. And I have a personal affinity for the exoskeleton because these are just so cool. There are machines that have... Um, uh, electrodes that are uh, placed on the body. There's a, a power pack, like a backpack that you wear. And then this stimulates um, walking movements. So a lot of people, you know, one of the things with spinal cord injury, one of the difficulties with walking <clears throat> is not so much getting, not so much now, getting the nerves and muscles to respond in that reciprocal gait pattern. That's kind of figured out. Um, but one of the big problems is balance and coordination because of proprioception of knowing where your body is in space. And for people with paralysis, you know, you, you, you're not getting that feedback of my arm is up, my arm is down, you know, my legs are moving, you know, where's my trunk? Um, so, you know, getting all of that coordinated and knowing what's going on. Uh, now these uh, exoskeletons, they're worn outside the body. 
Um, most people will use a walker, some other kind of device because of that coordination and balance. Um, they're very heavy. They've come down in size so immensely. And there are people that are working on like a suit, like a, a, a scuba diving suit, you know, one that fits real tightly to the skin. And then you would wear your clothes over it so people wouldn't even know that you had an exoskeleton on if that's was your goal, but you know, they're lighter weight. Um, still because of that balance and coordination with some of the exoskeletons that are on the market now, um, you need to have a person with you because of, you know, tripping, falling, you know, that balance and coordination is, is just such an issue. And that's the part that's going to be the bugaboo to con conquer there. So um, there's just a lot of options right now. They're all very expensive. Um, they will improve. The price will go down. I do want to give a shout out to the Cleveland FES Center, who has a, like a modular implant that's uh, really fascinating. So you can, you can get uh, um, do your arms, and then if you want to add on your legs, and then if you want to add on bowel and bladder, or however, what your needs are. Um, the Miami, my, uh, Miami Project is another fabulous place. They are doing some wonderful things. Um, yes, when you, when you go, if you go out of state, um, Kim, Kenneth has also written in, it was very expensive. Um, and he stayed at a rel relative's place, which cut some of his costs. There are some places that are these super centers where you can go. Um, if you're on Medicaid, that payer pays in the state. So like I live in St. Louis, it's right on the river. It's right on the Mississippi River. And right across the river is Illinois. So people who live in Illinois who have Medicaid cannot always come over here to St. Louis for their rehabilitation therapy, which would maybe be within driving range of their house if they're from Southern Illinois or just you know right across the bridge there. They have to go to um, other rehabilitation facilities in Illinois, sometimes up to the Chicago area where they're away from their family and their friends, their support system. So it can be quite challenging. Um, um, so Medicaid, they usually pay within the state. Sometimes they'll allow people to go outside the state. That's a whole exemption process. Um, I know there's their major spinal cord injury rehabilitation, their major model rehabilitation systems across. There's some super powerhouses for outpatient in a variety of different places. But if you don't have that financial mechanism or if your private payer says, oh, well, you know, we're not going to pay for you to go to wherever, it can be a real challenge. I one time had a patient that came um, to my uh, center where I was working and um, they, they had a, a huge extended family and they had bake sales and car washes until they got enough money to send their person um, for the rehabilitation training, specialty training that they desired. And, you know, you, you just have to give people credit for doing whatever people come to the forefront. So, you know, if you, if you're, being thwarted because you can't get what you think you need. Look at other ways of fundraising. Um, there's Hope, Help Hope Live, which is a fundraising organization, which is uh, very good because they have a, like a PR staff. I would call them a public relations staff that help you get your word out. If you're fundraising, you have to be very careful because that can roll into your income on your taxes. And if you do have Medicaid, it can affect your Medicaid dollars. And so you have to be very careful about this. Now, Hope Help Live, Hope Help Hope Live. I'm sorry, I'm botching your name. I'm sorry, Sunny. Uh, she's the director there, wonderful gal. Um, so they will, they will collect the funds and, and pay the organization so it's not an income for you. So, um, you know, be sure and be sure and use all the resources that you possibly can because it's important um, to get to get the treatment that you need, you know, however you can get it is it's important. So we'll get on to some more of the questions. There's a question here today about thoughts about Botox for muscle spasm. 
And so Botox is the treatment for muscle spasms. Now you can take oral medications. Some people choose to do that. If your spasms are very uh, light, the first level of treatment is that range of motion to exercise the muscle. That muscle in there is, is getting too much spasm. We call it tone now, but it's, it's getting too much, uh, uh, one, it's craving movement. That's what's causing those spasms. That muscle is desiring movement. It has its own reflex arc in there. So if it's not getting feedback from the brain, it's saying, where is it? Where is it? And so it starts tightening and spasming. And so actually doing some exercise is it will help tire that muscle and give it that stretch that it needs. Now, if the tone gets even as a little bit stronger than that, um, then you would want to um, think about maybe some oral medications. Some people uh, adapt to the oral medications. They like them. They take a small amount. It's just great. And there's a variety of different kinds and that works well for them. Some people, the spasticity gets so great that the oral medications just is not strong enough for them or it doesn't tolerate they don't tolerate it because oral medications work throughout your body. It, when you take a pill, it doesn't just go to the spot that hurts. Um, when you take medication, it goes to your entire body. So sometimes the medications for spasticities can make you tired or lethargic, um, kind of make you have a brain fog almost. A lot of times it gives dry mouth. And so you have to be very careful about that. That can be really irritating. So sometimes people will opt for Botox injections. And those just the, those are where the Botox is given just into that particular muscle. So it relaxes the muscle. It doesn't travel that much throughout your whole entire body. And so, and I say that much because anything that's injected to your body is going to get into your bloodstream, but it's, it's such a, it's insignificant that people don't even talk about it. Um, so uh, Botox is really a, 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 it's really the treatment of choice that most people are using nowadays. And then there's a question about a baclofen pump or the tablet. Well, tablets are, um, again, they have those side effects. They work well for many, many people um, and they get along just fine with those. For uh, It's not usually a matter of, um, of preference. It usually is based on the amount of spasticity you have. So a little bit of spasticity, the tablets work fine. If you have a, a bit more spasticity in particular areas, you can get the Botox injections. They can do several muscles, and that really that really helps um, a lot of people just do that. Now the injections have to repeat be repeated every four to six months, and you get a person who does these injections. They have a good idea how much. Botox to give you. It is a little bit of a trial and error. So they might say, you know, well, I got, I got too much, I'm too limp. And so they'll cut back on the Botox injection, or um, I got too much and it, it just, it just, you know, I, I was too, or I didn't get enough and the spasticity was still a problem. You know, some people will keep a little bit of spasticity uh, to use for transfers and different kinds of activities. So sometimes people don't want it completely eliminated. You know, it's all depends on what your needs, your individual needs are, but a practitioner who does Botox will have a great idea how much you need, especially in uh, children. So I see we have a listener who uh, has a son with an injury. And, you know, if you're thinking about Botox, they didn't ask this, but I'm just thinking about that. Um, uh, pediatrics, it's, it's a great treatment as well. Now the baclofen pump is a device that's implanted into your body. The pump itself is in, implanted into your abdomen under the skin. And then a little tube wire comes around and is put in the spinal canal where the spinal cord is. It does not go into the spinal cord. It goes into the spinal canal and it bathes the spinal cord uh, with the baclofen, uh, which really helps. Bac baclofen is the oral medication, which really helps just calm the whole spinal cord. So if you have a lot of spasticity, a baclofen pump might be the way to go. And so there's all different kinds. Now the baclofen is heavier 
than uh, spinal fluid. So it stays down in the bottom of the spinal cord. There are some practitioners, not a lot, but there are some around that if you have arm spasticity, they can put the pump in or a little bit higher to affect that. You have to be careful about how high you're putting in a baclofen pump because you don't want to cut off the respiratory system. You don't want, you know, if it's high up in your spine that that medication can roll up too high and, you know, it affects breathing. The pump does it does have to be refilled. So most of the time people have them put in the lower back. That's where the majority of them are. Now, um, usually there's a trial that's done to see how it works. And then if it works, um, then the insurance company usually app approves those. However, especially in pediatrics, they're just kind of bypassing the trial because they're working. And there's, they're doing such a good job with the baclofen pump that most pediatric patients don't do the trial anymore, which is kind of nice because you go to the tri trial and you see your loved one, your child, maybe it's your husband, your wife, your, what, who, whomever, they go through the trial. Oh, they're relieved of the spasticity. And it's just, it's just like night and day difference. And so people get really excited about that, but that wears off and then you have to wait six weeks till the pump can be put in it. And, you know, it's just kind of like seriously. So anyway, again, things are moving ahead really quickly. So um, that's one good thing is that, uh, especially in pediatrics, you don't necessarily have to wait that particular amount of time. So it's, you know, you start out with a range of motion, you might move up to a pill, the pill doesn't work out or the spasticity gets worse, you might do the Botox injections and then eventually the pump. That's kind of the hierarchy of the treatment for that. So now we have a person uh, that's looking for severe nerve pain options. What a wonderful question. Um, um, so severe nerve pain options. So again, there's, there's a hierarchy for this. So usually for uh, pain, shockingly, movement, helps. <laughs> I know people are like, no, I hurt. I don't want to move. But, you know, it's not movement, uh, quick movement. It's very, very gentle movement. So, you know, people who have arthritis, um, if they have very gentle movement, it really helps the arthritis. Now, if you start moving somebody around and jerking around their muscles in, in a no pain, no gain kind of way, then you're going to cause more pain. You're going to cause more discomfort, but very gentle movements. You want to be very kind to your body. So this is the hierarchy for pain. So you start out with that. You might move into um, different medications for pain control. If it's pain from spasms, you would move into the spasticity treatment. Um, if it's uh, neuropathic pain, that's pain from nerves. So, you know, we have muscular pain, um, you know, like where we've overworked our muscles. We've all known what that feels like. Um, sometimes there's nerve pain where a nerve is, is getting some kind of mixed signal. And so, People, nerve pain is horrible pain. If you've ever had a sore tooth, um, you know, with that nerve pain in the tooth, wow, that really hurts. Um, so nerve pain is very, very painful. And, it, and surprisingly, again, I'm going to say all these shocking things today, but when you get nerve pain, it's really a good thing because there's some message that's trying to get through. Something is working in that nerve, but it's not working correctly. So nerve pain is kind of like, it's a good thing because I've, I've got something going on. How do I harness that into something that's functional for me? But the pain can be so incapacitating, you have to do something about it. So there are medications, and there's a lot of different medications. Um, there's a depression and seizure medication that can be given in very, very small doses. So not effective for depression, not, a, not effective for seizures. But a side effect of those um, medications is reduction of nerve pain. So instead of giving like 100 or 200 milligrams for treatment for nerve, for um, depression or seizures, they'll give you like five or 10 milligrams and it just takes the edge off that nerve pain. So that's really nice. There are two medications, the gabapentin and the pregabalin, which are uh, marketed under the names of Neurontin and Lyrica. 
Those are medications that are specifically developed for nerve pain. Those can be very helpful. Going up again into the hierarchy of things, there are electronic devices that can be worn outside the body that will interfere with that message in that nerve. And so that, that uh, message will interrupt that nerve transmission to the brain. So the, the nerve is still acting out, but the message can't get to the brain. So you don't know that, it, that it's doing that. So that's very effective. There are also implants that can be put into the body onto that nerve that will break that pain message. In the most uh, significant uh, cases of nerve pain, and this, this is really not uh, done too much anymore, um, there's um, some injections of phenol that can be given. There's some other medications that can also be injected that can help uh, relieve that nerve pain. Phenol will kill the nerve. And so that's why we really don't do that too much anymore because we want those nerves to, to stay alive so you know they can be used in the future. But um, there are other medications that can be used to interrupt that message that will not kill the nerves. So phenol is used so much anymore. And then in the worst case scenario, they will go in and cut that nerve. And so the, the message can't get through, but we don't wanna do that either because we have options for those nerve interruptions and we have other options for things that will preserve that nerve because something's getting through, you could still have some recovery in there. So we don't like to do those real extreme things anymore. On rare occasions, they're still done, but those aren't really what we're going for. But in this particular case, this is a 47 year old man who has stomach pains. He's uh, quadriplegic, and they think it could be from uh, prolonged um, over-the-counter medication, you know, uh, acetaminophen or ibuprofen, which that certainly can uh, upset the stomach. So if it's a stomach problem, you might want to have a look in there, see if there's some ulcers in there, if there's some erosions. Um, also, just as a sidelight, there's a lot of people um, who have um, taken um, over-the-counter uh, medications for acid in the stomach that have created a lot of polyps. The side effect of long-term acid reduction medication is polyps in the stomach, and those can be painful. Those can uh, rupture and cause a lot of pain, or just the presence can cause a lot of pain. And then uh, uh, daily double full enema use. And there's theorized that there could be air trapped in the tissue, which is very possible. Now, um, you might want to look at, uh, so for the oral medications, you might want to look at taking those only after food have been eaten. You might want to consider, uh, look down the mouth into the stomach to see what's going on in there. Um, they can test to see if the acid is causing the problem. Um, you might want to look into talking to a GI specialist about um, the full enema use because that flushes out the bowel and doesn't allow the bowel to have its contraction and um, expansion like the bowel does with peristalsis. It just washes out the bowel and it tends to slow bowel function. So if you could talk to a spinal cord injury specialist about getting off of the enemas, which will, will be a bit of a challenge, um, but that would be another source of the problem that it could be from that chronic enema use. Um, it could also uh, overfill the bowel, uh, causing megacolon, which doesn't, you know, it, the colon's like the colon and the bladder, both like a balloon. They expand, they contract, they expand, they contract. So um, sometimes they get too expanded like a balloon and they can't contract back to their natural size. So then there's this thing where megacolon. And so if it can't, if the bowel can't do its peristalsis to squeeze the stool along, um, then, you know, you're going to have, you're going to have issues with that bowel could be backing up into the stomach. So a GI workup, if you haven't had that done, that's going to be something uh, that, that needs to be really uh, reviewed. Now I see that there's a question here in the chat and I wanna get back to it um, because it has to do with um, reactions to Botox, which we just spoke about. Um, so uh, just uh, uh, flexi 
dysreflexia, sweating, um, only a slight, so, so has there been autonomic dysreflexia with only a slight increase in blood pressure uh, to the Botox? Um, I have not heard so much from the Botox. People can have AD during the ejection, injection process because you know you have a needle stick, you don't feel it maybe because you have decreased sensation, but still that, that pain sensation is there. It's just not being received in the brain. That's where the autonomic nervous system starts to take over and you, you start getting um, autonomic dysreflexia symptoms. So it's usually from the injection process itself, not so much from the Botox. Um, so this gentleman said he, it co coincided with some shots in his thighs. And so that's what I'm just kind of thinking. It was the injection process. So if that, is, if that turns out to be a problem, either you need to be treated for AD so that you don't have the episode during the injection process, or you might want to think about um, a, a pump to um, ensure that that, that spasticity you know, that you don't have to go through those injections all the time. Um, they also said they had a wound, but they, they thought it would be more from the Botox. And, um, I, you, you know, it's a possibility from the Botox injection, um, but it, it's pretty rare. Let's put it that way. But that doesn't mean it didn't happen to you. So, you know, also something you can do is uh, before, if you want to have a second Botox injection, try having uh, some topical lidocaine and anesthetic put on the area before doing the injection and that cuts that pain response. And so then that won't stimulate the um, reaction from having the injection. So, um, oh, and then Kenneth also highlights too um, that uh, uh, pump that you can have in um, to have baclofen pump throughout your spinal cord. You can also have pain medication added to that. So if you're having, um, you know, body pains or aches, you can have that. Or if the spasticity causes pains or aches, you can have that put in there as well. So a lot of important tips and lots of um, lots of comments from the audience, which is always good because, you know, when you're sitting here and you're just trying to think of everything, it's always nice to have that little refresher. So thank you for your contributions to those who have participated. I always love that. Now there's one other question I did want to highlight, and that was somebody who was talking about excessive sweating after their spinal cord injury. And that's kind of an interesting thing because most people will sweat above the level of injury, but not below. Again, it's, a, it's an autonomic nerve uh, thing, but in healthcare for whatever rule there is, there's always, but in some cases. So, you know, it's very rare that people sweat below the level of their injury, but some people do. And when they do, they sweat and they sweat big time. And it's really a huge problem to the individual because this, their sheets will be wet, their clothes will be just saturated. They might have to change their sheets in the middle of the night. They have to change their clothes. It's just, I mean, we're talking about buckets of sweat. And those of you who've had this, you'll be like, yeah, it's buckets of sweat. Um, not a medical term, but you know, it's a lot of sweat. And so uh, there are treatments, anticholinergic drugs can help that with that sweating. Sometimes once you take those for a while and the sweating stops um, and you, you try to go off the anticholinergic drugs, sometimes the sweating is just resolved. Sometimes you just need something to go in there and say, you know, let's stop the sweating now. Um, some people get dehydrated. They sweat so much. Um, it's, you know, going out socially and, and just profusely sweating can be an issue. Now, if you sweat just like in a certain area or something, some people will sweat on one spot on their thigh. Um, you can take an antiperspirant and put on there and that will sometimes help control that. You can't wear that over your whole entire body, but sometimes if you have a local patch or something that will help too. Um, so, 
And so anyway, there, there, are, there's medications that you can take that can help that total body sweating. And you really want to talk to your healthcare provider um, to get on those medications that will make your mouth dry. Uh, but you know, it's working. So, you know, it, you might have to talk to them about the dosing. You might have to work with different things. There's some different medications uh, that have been developed and you can try, you know, different types of medications to see what works best for you until you find it. If you, if you go to the healthcare provider for anything and they give you a medication and it's just really not working, be sure and talk to them because they will have other uh, tools in their box to provide for you. So if you ever go to your healthcare provider and you find you have not been, you, you're really not getting what you need after a fair trial, you know, you don't want to be like, well, I tried this for an hour and it's not working. You know, after a few days, <clears throat> if you're having pain, you want to uh, talk to them uh, more quickly or if something, you know, is happening to your body that's an urgent or er, emergent condition, you certainly want to talk to them right away, but give, give their uh, therapy a trial. If it's not working, they don't want you to be uh, silently suffering. They want you to tell them. So that's that's an important thing. Um, so um, here's a person who has center of chest pain after urinating and their C12 incomplete, which um, yes, it could be a sign of cardiac issues. It could also be a sign of um, if you're having to strain while you're uh, urinating. It could be that, you know, you're, you're holding your breath and uh, bearing, you know, trying to bear down to get that urine out. So it could be that, you know, maybe you need to relax your body maybe more when you're urinating. So be sure and try relaxing, but um, check with your um, physician to see you might need to have a urodynamic test to see if that the straining is so much, the pressure in your uh, bladder and your urethra is not responding accordingly. It might be time to try something else. There might be some medication that you can take that will improve your flow. There might be some medication that will help contract your bladder as your sphincter opens. Maybe your sphincter is not opening enough. Maybe the bladder is not contracting enough. And so you might need a urodynamic test to see what's going on there because you don't want to have to strain so much that the urine's backing up into your kidneys because the kidneys do not store urine, only the bladder does. If you're storing urine in your kidneys, your urine, your kit, the urine is damaging your kidneys because there's no place to store urine. So then the kidney tissue is being um, smushed because it's holding the urine. So be sure and, and uh, check with your um, healthcare provider. You probably need urodynamic testing. It could be cardiac, but you probably uh, more than likely need some neurodynamic testing with a little bit of help uh, to see what's going on with that. Now, um, one last thing I want to say before we close today, and that is um, there's some people that have written in and they're, they're looking for help. It's a pretty general question, but when I read that, I think, oh my goodness, here's somebody who's really, really struggling and really having a difficult time because there's so much going on that I just need help. Could you please help me? And yes, we want to help you. And at the Christopher and Dana Reed uh, Paralysis Foundation, they want to help you. So there are ways that you can get contact. You can certainly take advantage of all the literature that's available to you on the website. Take advantage of uh, talking to peer mentors, people who've been through this that know, know what it's like and have some education as far as helping to guide you through it. Um, it's not a one-upsmanship kind of thing. These are people that will really help you. You can contact me through the webpage um, if you don't want to do it over a format like this, you can send a contact uh, message to me and, and you'll get a response from me directly. Um, also, I do want to highlight and really stress that there are information specialists that have been educated about everything about paralysis. I really admire this group of people. Um, they can help funnel you to the right resources. They can provide you with uh, information about the issue that you're having. Uh, they can, they are wonders. They are just wonders. They can help you walk through insurance process information. 
they they have done this many of them for many years but they know what they're talking about and the information there is on the chat box so please you can get through you can uh, contact them through the uh, web refoundation web page you can call them at 800-539 7309 and ask for an information specialist. They are more than happy to help you. So we have information specialists, we have peer mentors. You can you can ask a question to me. We're all open and available. So please, um, the new year's coming. Uh, be safe. Be safe with the COVID. Um, bad weather's coming. Be safe with the bad weather. It doesn't matter if you have paralysis or if you don't. These are all things we all need to be safe and cautious about. I thank you for a wonderful year, and I look forward to some new beginnings next year. We've got some new programs that are uh, starting, and so stay tuned, and I'll see you next month. Thanks for tuning in.